Hello everyone, I wanted to read to you guys an excerpt from an article that I found that I thought was very interesting that has a lot to do with uh, the sciences, quantum mechanics, the theory of relativity, so physics-based article, science-based article. Uh, but I think the preface or the introduction to the article is something that uh, I've been thinking about and ruminating on for a very long time and even touched on in my last video, the two-hour uh, plus long video that I just uploaded. And um, I want to talk about how this relates to the points that I was making earlier about how we need to start moving away from uh, the labeling of the phenomena that we're witnessing in terms of gender interaction, feminism, gynocentrism, traditionalism, how the, gender, how the genders interact with each other. Uh, we need to stop defining them in these limited isms uh, that constrain us and limit us in our understanding of the situation at hand between the genders and uh, the, the human animal and our analysis of the human animal and its behavior. So this article that I found is called The Limits of My Language Are the Limits of My World. And I'm going to read to you the, the uh, introduction to that right now. It says, one of the famous aphorisms that have been plucked out of Wittgenstein's, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, Wittgenstein's Tractatus Logico Philosophicus is the limits of my language are the limits of my world. Like much in the Tractatus, this gnomic aphorism invites interpretation and can never be exhausted. One way to construe this Wittgensteinian uh, very broadly, or Wittgensteinism very broadly, would be to think of it as the limits of my idiom are the limits of my world, with idiom construed broadly to include any way of talking about the world and not merely a particular language. If you're of the continental persuasion, you could say that the limits of my discourse are the limits of my world. It amounts to pretty much the same thing. Particular theories about the world are idioms for talking about the world, forms of discourse, if you will. Scientific theories are scientific idioms for talking about the world. Now, scientific theories often broaden our horizons and allow us to see and understand things of which we were previously unaware, but a scientific theory being a particular idiom, as it is, may also limit us and limit the way we see the world. The limitations we take upon ourselves by thinking in terms of a particular theory or speaking in particular ways are human limits that we have chosen for ourselves. They are not intrinsic limitations imposed upon us by the world. And this, of course, is something that Wittgenstein wanted to bring to our explicit attention. We very frequently mistake the idioms we employ and the particular ways in which we understand these idioms to constitute the very fabric of the world. When, in this frame of mind, we make claims for our theories that are not supported by the theories themselves, but rather reflect our particular limited understanding of very difficult matters. This has been the case with the general theory of relativity and quantum theory, both of which, of course, are very young sciences, but which now dominate physics. Because of the dominant position of these theories and of the particular interpretations of these theories, we forget how young they are and how far we have to go in really coming to an adequate understanding of them. Uh, and then it goes on, and, you know, it's an interesting article to read. It's, it's relatively short, but it's definitely interesting. So, you know, it, that'll be in the description box if you want to read that. But I find it extremely interesting, and this was the point that I was trying to make uh, in terms of how we describe things, how we describe uh, things like gynocentrism, feminism, and the nature of the human animal is dependent on what we frame it in and whether or not we frame it in limiting vernacular and syntax uh, and lexicology. If we decide that we're going to just portray feminism as a, as a, as a um, result of things like leftism, uh, strictly political analysis uh, and, and interpretations, you know, cultural Marxism, feminism, so on and so forth, if we explain these things, these events that are going on in our society and civilization as merely a function of, of an errant political philosophy, then we limit ourselves and we limit our understanding and really do a disservice to ourselves in our quest to understand why it is that men are being vilified, why it is that uh, women are held to a lower standard. Uh, we really need to uh, start analyzing the human ecology, like I said in, in my previous video. We really need to start analyzing it from a perspective that allows us to render a, a simplistic but yet complex understanding of uh, the human animal. And what do I mean by that? Well, when I say simplistic, I mean that we should be able to describe it in simplistic language, 2 plus 2 equals 4, uh, consequential 
uh, a scenario based uh, language that seems to follow a smooth pattern of logic and reason when we when we lock it into something along the lines of cultural marxism or something along the lines of complete biological determinism what we do is that we now have created this idiom right this idiosyncratic method of uh, or of analysis and approach to viewing the world and analyzing the world that boxes us into a set uh, thought pattern uh, that we are going to reinforce and and not even realize consciously that we're reinforcing this an example of something like this is I've often wondered whether or not uh, some polyglot, somebody who knows, uh, somebody like Stardust, for example, who knows multiple languages uh, and not just languages of, of speech and languages of human communication, but I'm talking about languages of, for example, uh, somebody who knew English, uh, Chinese, uh, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, right? All of these languages, but also at the same time was well versed and and uh, understood uh, intimately uh, the nuance of, of computer code, uh, various computer languages, C++, Java, so on and so forth, Python, uh, every, pretty much every computer language that is in use today on any large scale. Now, if we were to uh, go to America, right, and analyze, right, over the course of 10, 15 years and exhaustively analyze the, the idiosyncratic, the subconscious idiosyncratic manifestations of the American mind and uh, specifically our, our adherence to the English language and, and analyze how that comes out in our code, how that manifests itself when we're coding uh, computer programs. And if we were to compare this to how, for example, uh, people who speak Mandarin, uh, who are also uh, software engineers or computer programmings and see how they space out their their code and see how their code reflects their language and determine whether or not uh, their language is, is locking them into uh, specific patterns of thought that are unique to them and their language, much like your fingerprint is unique to you and you could never leave a fingerprint on a glass or a doorknob or what have you without leaving that unique identifier that represents uh, you. If we were to analyze computer programming and things of that nature and somebody who was uh, well versed in multiple languages and multiple computer languages, would there be identifying characteristics of the Japanese, of the Chinese, of the Americans, of the British, of the various uh, uh, ethnicities and cultures in Latin America, Asia, and really throughout the world? Is language this great separator of the human species? Um, is language structured in a way, and, and, and I think that this is, almost, this is almost certain, is language structured in a way that forces us into patterns of thought? Uh, depending on which language that we choose, that we are, were born into, or which languages we learn. I know that for me, um, my first language was uh, Spanish. I, I grew up speaking Spanish first, and that's a distant memory. I still speak Spanish fluently now, but that's a distant that's a distant memory. Part that's really hard for me to wrap my hand around is that at one point, because I I think in English now, at one point in my lifetime when I was very young. Um, and I still remember my first, my first uh, word that I learned in English. It was the word snake, by the way. That's all I really remember of, of my, my time as a Spanish speaker and more importantly as a Spanish thinker. Uh, the, the part that's hard for me to wrap my head around is that at one point, all of my thoughts, all of my thoughts were contained within uh, the Hispanic language. Right. And now and now I think in, in terms of English. Right. I haven't had a thought in Spanish. Uh, for years and years and years. I can't even remember the last time I was thinking in my head uh, before I formulate sentences and convey them to people in, in, in Spanish. I just can't remember the last time that happened. I must have been five, six, seven years old. I don't know. Uh, but how has, you know, if I could look into a crystal ball and analyze how I would have been different, um, how my thought patterns would have been different, had I had I uh, remained a, a Spanish thinker, uh, even if I went on to learn English, uh, ha had I remained a, a Spanish thinker, meaning my thoughts happened in the Spanish language, and then I would I would translate them into the English language. What I mean, what would that have? How how would that have changed my identity? And 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 so that's an interesting question to wonder about and ask and. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of studies revolving around uh, people who who know more than one language and 
uh, differences between people who only speak one language and what they're more likely to to do. And so there's definitely statistics and analysis that say that because you speak another language, you're more likely to do this, right? So there's evidence that shows us that language, the languages you speak, uh, have an effect on your development as a human being as, as, as you grow from childhood, uh, from infancy to childhood to adulthood. So uh, we have to then ask ourselves the question, what, what uh, does straining our analyses of feminism, uh, of, of everything that's happening in the world uh, in terms of gender, what does it do to us in, in terms of our ability to uh, accurately assess it when we're only assessing it in terms of feminism, in terms of Marxism, in terms of this or that. So we have to have a complete, a complete look right, at, at what, what are the contributing factors to feminism, and we have to come at it from various different um, um, perspectives and various different um, methods of analysis. So if we lock ourselves into this uh, one mode of thought, I think that this is going to be a negative thing for our ability to determine what is actually driving uh, the spread of feminism and um, how, we, how we rectify those issues. Anyway, that's all I want to say for now, um, but thanks for listening, gentlemen.